Right? Neil? Yeah? OK. Uh, is this microphone working OK, guys? Great. Uh, so I'm going to talk about these things during my hour. So uh, I think Neil's hinted at the motivation is trying to get the computational cost of computing in a GP down a bit. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, sort of some of the history, what people have done in sparse GPs, just a little bit of why they're called sparse GPs. It's a bit of a misnomer. Uh, and then I get into, into the sort of technical section. I'm going to think, introduce to you how I think about posteriors in Gaussian processes. Uh, and how we do that in a sparse way, how we do that in a computationally efficient way. Um, then I'm going to talk about the idea of callback liable divergences between processes and how we make predictions in, in, a, in a computationally efficient way. And then I'm just going to summarize, and I've got a little demo with a, with a notebook uh, which shows what's going on, and I'll share that with you guys as well. Okay. <coughs> so. You've seen uh, lots of pictures over the last day, I guess, and certainly this morning there were lots of pictures of covariance matrices. And Neil talked about the com main computation you have to do, which is probably on the board somewhere, which is you have to invert this matrix and multiply by y, or you have to solve k inverse y somehow. And uh, that's expensive. That costs on the order of n cubed operations, where n is the number of data points. And that seems... Um, that, that seems expensive. And if you want to do multiple output Gaussian processes, it kind of gets even worse because now n is kind of really the number of data points times the dimensionality of the output. So you've now got number of data points cubed times dimensionality of the output cubed operations. And that's just, uh, that's just really hard to deal with. And also, you've just got to store this matrix. So actually, it turns out that. Uh, if you've got a nice, shiny, fast computer, maybe this n cubed isn't so bad, but it's really going to trash your machine unless you've got very large amounts of RAM. It takes a long time just to compute the matrix sometimes. So these sparse TP methods move us from this kind of really horrible regime of computation to this kind of less horrible regime of computation that's still not great. There's a tunable parameter m, which you might think of as the sparsity of the approximation. And your computation is going to be bounded by something in the order of nm squared. And you're going to, your storage is going to be bounded by something which is bounded by nm. So dramatic improvements, and usually at relatively small losses in accuracy, depending on how you choose the parameter m. So what's, uh, what's like the, the quick, short, dirty version of this talk? Well, this is the matrix we've been looking at. And we're going to replace this with this matrix. And it's going to be made up of this product of these three matrices. So you've got a skinny matrix, and the same matrix transpose, and the same matrix in the middle. And if you were trying to solve this system into a vector, then you can use a nice trick that reduces the computational complexity right down. But obviously, this isn't exactly the right matrix, so we're not really solving exactly the right problem. A lot of this talk, though, is going to sort of abandon this slide and this idea of I'm approximating this matrix. I don't really like that view of, uh, of uh, sparse GPs. Uh, it, it happens to come up in the case for regression only, but it doesn't really give us much understanding of what the approximation is doing. So that's where the computational savings come from. And the rest of this talk is, how, do, how did we get to here? Where did these matrices come from? When will the approximation be good? How do we understand what's happening? So this is a very brief and sparse history lesson. So why are they called sparse TPs? Well, the simplest thing you could probably do to reduce your computation is just throw away some of your data. Right? You could just say, well, I'm just going to pick every other data point and then fit my GP to that. Uh, so you just have sort of few and scattered data points in some way. And then you might say, well, it's pretty dumb to just throw away every other data point or to throw them away at random. So what if I sort of worked out which data points to keep based on some information criterion, based on uh, how much information I thought those data points contained? <coughs> 
So this is why they were called sparse in the beginning. And then uh, what happened was people developed these ideas quite a bit. And now it doesn't really look sparse anymore, but we still call them sparse TPs. So there was a nice paper in 1985 by uh, ever-present ever Silverman. And he's basically doing standard sparse TPs, throwing away some of the data, throwing away some of the regressors. Uh, and this, uh, one of the papers, one of the earlier papers that I could find on this information theoretic, which data points should we include, was by Smaller and Bartlett, 2001. And then Ed Snelson, in his PhD thesis, and, and in a paper, came along and said, well, let's, you know, GPs have all of these sort of infinite number of, uh, of variables in them. And rather than just throwing away data points, maybe we could, uh, maybe we could sort of make the set of variables we keep not intersect with the set of variables of the data. Or another way to think about it is, what if I introduce another uh, set of input-output pairs, and try to, which is smaller than the data set, and try to use that to summarize the GP? So that's what Ed was doing then. And then uh, Mikanis came along and took these kind of ideas with this sort of pseudo data set. I'll talk about that quite a lot. And did this in a variational way. And uh, just recently, uh, Alex Matthews showed that what Michalis is doing is actually minimizes the KL divergence between two processes. So if you're familiar with variational Bayes and minimizing callback level divergences, you might think, well, the KL between two processes sounds like a difficult thing because this is like an infinite object, right? So uh, Alex spent a lot of time dealing with me measure theoretic ways to define this KL divergence. But it's a nice way to think about what's going on. There's a real posterior stochastic process, and we're going to try to approximate it with one that's cheaper to compute in. Right. So I should probably mention that this is an appropriately sparse history for sparse TPs. If you look on Google Scholar, there are thousands and thousands of hits for sparse Gaussian processes. But this is sort of the lead up to uh, what, I'm, what I'm going to be telling you about. And I'm pretty much going to focus on, on leading up to this, this paper here. And the reason for that is I think this is the most extensible uh, vision of sparse GPs. So you can, uh, you can do a lot of things with this vision of, of what's happening. You can do non-Gaussian likelihoods. You can do multiple outputs. You can do all kinds of nice things with that. OK, so here's my picture of GPs. We've spent a lot of time looking at this equation, or I imagine you have. Uh, P of y is a normal about y given zero and k, what I would call kff plus sigma squared i. So the uh, the data vector y is Gaussian distributed in this in this marginal likelihood. But sort of before that, we really had a P of f, and that was. Uh, normally distributed is about 0 in kff. And this thing here came, came from the noise. And we said, well, we can marginalize f out exactly and get this marginal likelihood. That's great. And that marginal likelihood really belongs on the bottom of Bayes' rule, right? So we really had p of, we had a p of f given y is equal to p of y given f. This was just some Gaussian noise with, uh, with this, this variance. We had a p of f, which was this guy. And we had a p of y, which was what do you get when you normalize these things? And I'm sure it's been emphasized that GPs are wonderful models because you can compute this thing exactly. So you've, inf you've integrated across an infinite number of parameters and got the marginal likelihood, and there's just not very mod many models at all where you can do that. It's a real, real selling point for GPs. Uh, but what I want to focus on is actually this object instead. What is the posterior across the function looking like? And when we make a prediction in a GP, what, what do we do? And is, is the posterior still a Gaussian process? The prior was a Gaussian process. We used a Gaussian process prior. Well, here's my, here's my picture. So there's what, uh, what I think of as the input space, x, and the response space, y. And these are noisy, noisy observations of a function. This will be fairly straightforward. And 
we're going to say f of x is drawn from a TP. So f of x is a Gaussian process. And the marginal properties of the TP mean that you only have to look at the process where you've got the data points. So we can kind of forget about the rest of the process for a while. So that's, uh, that's this term here. And what I'm showing you on this picture is um, this sort of solid blue line is really meant to represent a stochastic process. If I had more time, I'd have made it all wiggly like Neil does. But uh, just imagine that my line is wiggly. And then the solid points are the values of the function or values of the stochastic process where we have data. So they're not the data points. They're, they're the noiseless function values. And then we do some inference. Then we use this equation over here, and we work out, given the data, what is my posterior distribution for these points. So I'm trying to represent that with these vertical blue bars. So this, these represent the marginals of my posterior distribution. And then I need to make a prediction, right? So somebody's going to say, well, what happened to the, the process here? How do I predict to get this, this mean of variance over here? And to do that, well, we do this. We write, um, there are two ways you can do it, I guess. And I think one of the ways is you can look at uh, the covariance between y and what you might call f star. So you might think of, uh, you know, because of the Gaussian noise, y and the function are jointly Gaussian distributed. So now you can just take the conditional Gaussian equation for, for f star given y. I think that's probably the way it's been presented so far. But another way to think about it is uh, you can do the integral p of f star given f p of f given y d f like that. Which is sort of more standard in a, in a Bayesian perspective, right? We compute a posterior in, in Bayes' world. We compute the posterior, and then we compute functionals of the posterior that we're interested in to make predictions. And actually, of course, these are totally equivalent. If you just do this, this integral here, you'll get the, the marginal of a joint Gaussian uh, thing back. But this view is kind of useful in, in sparse TPs and trying to work out what's happened. So I'm going to have a, so I haven't got to a sparse CP yet, but I just want to have a little note about the non-parametric nature of what's happening here. So when, when you first start looking at TPs, you think, OK, this is great. I've got this infinitely flexible thing, non-parametric. And I think, well, how on earth am I going to represent that in a computer program? I've got an infinite number of variables, and I definitely don't have infinite memory. And of course, it's the marginal property that saves you. So people say, well, you only need to deal with this KFF matrix. But what happened to the rest of it? Well, you represented the rest of it in this thing here. And of course, to compute this thing, you only need the kernel. You need the kernel. So you've sort of encapsulated the rest of the stochastic process in, in this equation here via, via the kernel. So the non-parametricness sort of comes at predict time. This is all finite. All of this equation is just Gaussians on some finite vectors. And the infinite thing comes in this f star when we're trying to predict uh, at, at some new points. So what's the uh, equivalent picture for a sparse GP? Well, we're going to introduce an extra data set, data set in some way. We're going to have some extra input points to the function, which I'm going to call z. And we're going to call the values of the Gaussian process at those points u for historical reasons. That's what they were called originally. But they're just extra points on the function. And uh, now I'm going to have this joint model here. So I'm going to have, uh, I'm going to use my marginal conditional properties of a Gaussian process to say I can just write everything I'm interested in like this. And really, if you look at what I've done here, there's, there should be a p of f star given f and u over here. So the, 
I'm ignoring all the points on the function apart from those at the data and apart from those at the extra points that I've picked. So I'm just going to stack Z, these extra points, onto the bottom of X. And conveniently, Z is going to be a smaller set than X. That's kind of where our computational savings is going to come from. And if you look at the joint covariance matrix across the whole thing, you can divide it into these chunks. And uh, you might think about this chunk here. I sometimes call it KFF. And this chunk here, I might call it KFU. And this one here, I might call KUU. So our equations, you, you should be familiar with all of these guys. So this is, this is our Gaussian noise again. Uh, this is just a Gaussian process prior for the points where, that we've introduced. That's, that, this is pretty standard. And this thing here, P of F given U, this is familiar, right? You know how to do, if you've given some points in GP, you already know how to predict the rest of them. So this is just uh, a Gaussian process prediction equation. And I've, I've abbreviated K tilde here, but K tilde, I guess, should be uh, KFF. Oh, a different notation in my slides. KNN uh, minus KNM, KMM inverse KMN, like that. So this, you already know how to make the predictive covariance for a, for a GP. Right? This is, this sort of says, if I'd had the observations are you exactly how would I predict for the rest of the GP at the point F. All the equations are looking familiar. So how does it look in a picture? Well, I've introduced these uh, extra points in red. Uh, so I've still got my stochastic process presented by this blue line. I've got this extra data set in red. And uh, that's just given by this equation. And then... I'm going to somehow get the posterior of the process at this small number of points. I'm going to get P tilde of, over U given Y and X. And the tilde is kind of important because actually to compute P of U given Y and X, to compute the real posterior at those points, I wouldn't save any computation. Right? I, would, uh, I, would, I would just have to do all the Gaussian process machinery and invert a really big matrix and then you know, there would be a new game. So we're going to approximate the posterior at this small number of points. And then when I make a prediction, what am I going to do? Well, I'm going to say, I'm going to do exactly the same equation as over here. I'm going to say, let's do uh, integral P of F star given U, P tilde of U du, to make a prediction for a new point. What's really cool about this equation is my approximation is still a stochastic process. My approximation still has an infinite number of basis functions in it. They're contained in here, just like they were contained in here for the full, full on GP. Any questions? Yeah. Can you explain again what Z is? Z, what is, what is Z? Z? Yeah. Z is the positions in Z and X live in the same space. So the X are the positions that you've got for data, and Z are some extra parameters that we've introduced, which are the positions at which we're going to summarize the GP. So if uh, X and F are somehow input-output pairs, then Z and U are somehow input-output pairs as well. Yeah? I, I can't hear you. Can I? This, this, this tilde here. Yeah, well, uh, so this is what I'm going to get to. This is, this is what's coming next. But uh, what I, all I really want to do is emphasize uh, somehow this distribution is going to summarize what the GP is doing at those points. And then I can't compute it exactly. I can't compute the real P. I can't comp well, I could compute that, but it would be expensive. So the, this P tilde which I'm going to derive in the next couple of slides, tells me uh, what's happening to the, the GP at these points. Okay. <laughs>
This looks like some horrible equations, but you're all familiar with this, right? So, uh, this is what I wrote on the board a second ago. This says to compute the posterior at f, I have some likelihood, some prior, and some marginal likelihood. Instead of doing that, I'm going to treat u like they're the proper parameters of the model. So, I'm going to treat, compute this posterior at u given y and z. I'm just going to apply Bayes' rule in exactly the same way. I've got p of y given u, p of u given z. So this is the Gaussian process prior at u. This is, this is some likelihood for, for u. And then this is uh, some marginal down here. But the sticking point is to compute p of y given u is going to cost order n cubed operations. So we're going to try to, uh, in order to get to this equation, to get anything useful, we're going to have to approximate p of y given u. So how are we going to do that? Well, we're going to use variational bays. Variational bays, fans, advocates, a couple. Variational bays, novices, lots of you. Okay. Okay, so this is um, this is like uh, somehow diving into the deep end of a burning lava pit of variational bays. <laughs> uh, so I'll, I'll try to make it as straightforward as I can. But what I want to do is, I want to get some conditional distribution that approximates p of y given u. So. I'm writing Bayes' rule down here again, but this isn't quite the same as we had before, right? This just says uh, I can write p of y given u as the real likelihood, so I, I'm happy to deal with this thing here because this is just Gaussian noise. And p of f given u, which is somehow uh, a prior for f conditioned on u, and I can divide by this marginal down here. And what I want is some approximation to this guy that's cheaper to compute. And I want to do it in a way that uh, I'm going to say it minimizes the callback level divergence. So we're going to have, instead of having this thing exactly, we're going to have some function which uh, approximates this function well, but isn't quite a probability distribution. Hopefully it'll be clear by the end of the slide. So the derivation is, is straightforward, I think. Nobody should have any difficulties with this. I've just taken the log of the equation. So I've just logged the left-hand side and logged this hand side, and I've, I've just separated these guys out because that's going to be convenient in a second. Nothing horrible there. And then I'm going to manipulate this by taking the expectation of both sides of the equation under P of F given u. Strange thing to do, maybe, but uh, this side here doesn't change because there's no F on this side. So taking the expectation of uh, log p of y given u under, under p of f given u just does nothing. And on this side here, I'll look at this expression here, which is going to be pretty key in a second. And this thing here, anybody recognize what this is? Yeah, it's a callback Leibler divergence, right? So variational based advocates are like, yeah, callback Leibler divergence. Variational based novices are like, what on earth is, what on earth is that? And Oh, there's a missing log here. This cormac libel divergence between these two guys, uh, we're going to ignore it. We're going to drop it. We're going to use this p tilde of y given u, which I'm defining as this guy here. There should be a log in front of these guys. Uh, we're going to use this as a proxy for p of y given u. And then we're going to turn the Bayes machine we handle and, and, and continue. But this is a really good opportunity right now to uh, investigate what we've lost in the approximation. By, by having a look at this guy. So uh, callback Leibniz divergences are measures of how similar distributions are. So you take two distributions, you throw them into the callback Leibniz divergence black box, and it gives you a number back which is larger than zero. And the number is only going to be zero if the two distributions were identical. And uh, the, the numbers that come back are ordered by how similar the distributions are. 
So if we throw this thing away and it was zero, then we didn't lose anything. Because if this is zero, then this distribution must be exactly p of y given u. And if this thing is really large, then we're in trouble for throwing it away because we're, we're, we've got a very sloppy approximation. Uh, okay, let's, let's ignore that slide for a second. So let's have a think about this guy here. What is the callback level divergence between p of f given u and p of f given y and u? So if we go back to our picture in a second, uh, we're going to think about how we would predict f given u and how much information we gain by adding in y. Right. Uh, maybe I should just draw this. So if these are some, uh, these are y up here, and these are some f's, and I've got a I've got a u point here, which would be red in my previous diagrams, then p of f given u is a sort of a Gaussian process that has this kind of variance, right? So in this case here, p of f given u is this big distribution, but P of f given y in u, well, because the variance here is very large, if I was to observe y, I would get some kind of collapsing of the, of the process around those points. So this approximation is pretty poor. On the other hand, if I moved my u points if I moved my u points such that they were say here and here, so these are this is u1 and this is u2, so they're close between the process, then p of f given u is a gp that looks something like this. That's clear. So uh, predicting for the f points given u has very small variance. So when I observe the y's, I don't gain very much information. So the whole thing really comes down to uh, how well can you predict f using u? If you can predict f perfectly using u, you're golden. It'll work perfectly. If that prediction will be sloppy, it's not going to work so well at all. <clears throat> so this, this idea of this conditional variant, the, the variance of this distribution, is going to come back up in a second. And it's going to conveniently arrive in our algorithm, which is going to, which is going to be a nice thing. OK, so this next slide is really for variational Bayes advocates. And I'm, I'm just going uh, to skip that for a second. Uh, I'll, can I come back to your question in a second? I'm just going to finish this little thread, and I'll be right with you. OK, so we're going to approximate this likelihood, and then we're going to throw that likelihood into our Bayes machinery. And it turns out that this, this approximation, which you remember from the previous slide, was uh, the expectation the p of f given u log p of y given f. Turns out to be as this thing on the screen here. So sigma squared is the variance of my noise. And it turns out to be this, this, uh, this normal distribution, this is like a, like a GP prediction from u to f. This is just exactly like the mean prediction for a GP, uh, but with sigma squared noise. And then there's this thing which is constant in Y and U, which is just turns out to be the trace of the variance of the, uh, of the of P of F given U. It's kind of nice, right? So this thing is going to uh, propagate through the algorithm and it's going to penalize our optimization in a second. It says that if you don't have, uh, if you don't have a small conditional variance, if you, if you can't predict the f points well using the u points, then uh, your callback level divergence is going to be large. Okay. And this thing here sort of acts as a, as a false sort of likelihood. OK? Right. So we take this equation, which looks ugly, 
but we're going to pop it into Bayes' rule, and we're going to get this posterior p tilde of u given all of the other things, which is exactly the object that we wanted. Because then we can plug that into the prediction equation, and we're away. And we get, we get a couple of nice things out of this. One is, to normalize this equation, when you see this integral, it's a Gaussian integral, it's all tractable, and it gives us an approximation to p of y. In fact, it gives us a lower bound on p of y, or lower bound on log p of y, which is handy because now we can use this as a proxy for p of y to optimize our covariance function parameters. It also gives us a, a nice posterior for u. And if you think right back to the beginning of my talk, I had this slide about how the covariance matrix was approximated. It gives us something that looks like that slide. If I show you what's happening in here, the, the denominator of Bayes' rule, the approximate p of y, looks like this low rank approximation to the covariance. So it looks like we've got a low rank approximation to the covariance, and then we've got this penalty here as well. Is that kind of clear? I think it'll become clearer when you start playing with this thing, and I've got some demos and, and so on to go with it. Uh, yeah, you had a question. You are the values of the function at these additional points, exactly. Yeah, so yeah. the key picture is the one with the red bars in it. Okay. So these vertical red bars represent p tilde of u. u are the values of the function, z are the positions here. So u, u are on this axis, z are on this axis. When you write the so, for instance, here on this slide, you have uh, p of u given y x. So y are values, x are points. Here, yeah, OK, you're right. So this should really have a z here as well. Uh, yes. That, that's missing from the notation. OK, yeah. yes. Um, so the question was, is it some, something is still assumed, uh, some conditioning, but it is not written explicitly? Is, is it so? When you when you discuss the, or, or write values of the function, you need to know also where those values yeah, exactly. are. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, to this notation here, this is a typo in my slide. Should have a a, a z in it, yeah, right, yeah. in here, and then uh, that only tells you what the function is doing at the point z. And when you want to know what the function is doing everywhere else, you use this equation here, which is just like GP prediction if you view it as this integral. So you say, well, if you integrate p of f star given u, p tilde of u, dv. So that tells you, so I guess this should really have an x star and an x in it, oh, and a z in it. And this should really have a z uh, given z, like that. Yeah. 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 In the notation, some things are Yeah. So yeah. occasionally, we've, so in all of this notation up here, we've, we've sort of dropped, uh, dropped an x from here. And so on. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So that's uh, that, that's for um, sort of for clarity, but clearly uh, it's not so clear. Okay. Yeah. I was just wondering, well, when does it become an approximation? Because you say a p tilde is an approximation for yeah. the posterior. It becomes an approximation uh, because uh, I'm going to. Right. Uh, if, if you take p oh. of u given. It comes, it comes an approximation because uh, oh yeah, here it becomes an approximation because I'm just going to I'm just going to drop this guy here. I'm just going to assume that that's zero, and then I'm going to use this. So if this is small, then the approximation will be okay. I'm going to say that's zero, and I'm just going to use this log p tilde as as uh, to find up here. OK? There's lots more to come. <laughs> OK. So we end up effectively solving the Gaussian process system at a smaller number of points. And we have this slightly weird likelihood thing going on. 
Um, we've looked at these, we've looked at these. Okay, so what do you, if you want to write some computer code for doing this, then what, what should you do? Um, well, you've got this bound on log p tilde of y that I've shown you. And that's a function of the covariance function parameters. So you could use this as a proxy for the marginal likelihood and just optimize your covariance function parameters in the way that I'm sure you've been looking at the last day. But it's also uh, a function of the position z at which you put these inducing inputs. So it actually makes sense to optimize theta and z jointly in order to improve the approximation and improve the estimate of theta. So you could imagine uh, fixing theta and optimizing z or fixing z and optimizing theta. But it turns out that most of the time we just optimize the two things together. Why does it make sense to optimize z against log p of y? Well, what, what can z do? What we really want to do is move z around, move the positions of these, of these pseudo points around so that the, uh, the approximation is really good. So that that callback Leibniz divergence term becomes really small, the thing that I threw away. And the nice thing is that I, have, uh, I can write down that p tilde of y is equal to log p of y minus kl q of uh, p tilde of u, p of f given u from p of f. So here's a callback libel over this term that I want to make really small. So if I'm going to, so this is really, as you've helpfully pointed out, this is really given z and x over here. So if I maximize this thing with respect to z, this is a fixed quantity over here, so I must be minimizing this quantity over here. Seems like reasonable logic. So you could imagine for some fixed theta, you could just optimize z to try to make this thing smaller. This thing here is another one of those annoying objects that costs order n cubed to compute. This thing here costs order of n m squared, and this thing here costs order of n cubed. So we're going to use this as a proxy to try to get this thing small. Let me show you a little demo before I continue with the rest of the talk. Um, so this is all in GPy. Uh, I'm going to generate a faux data set. And it's not going to be a very big data set because I, I want to do it in just two seconds on my laptop. But it's going to sort of demonstrate the, the principles of, of what's happening here. So here's a very silly UTP regression problem with a very small number of points, 50 points or so. And I can do exact GP inference in it for, for comparison. Now, here is a sparse GP model. And what I've done is I've, I've picked these Z points. I'm marking them in red on the horizontal axis here. So these are the pseudo input points. And I'm showing you the, the uh, approximate posterior of the whole process again in blue. And you can kind of see this is not a very good approximation. So uh, it, it doesn't really behave nearly as nicely as this guy over here. So this, uh, this variance over here is much too big. It's got some really weird behavior going on here where the variance is too small. What's going on here? And unsurprisingly, you can kind of see that where you've got these Z guys is behaving pretty well. So in this region here, it's kind of OK. And in this region here, it's kind of OK. But in the other regions, it, it's not so good at all. Yeah. So I'm colorblind too, and I can't see the red. How many sets are these in, in uh, how many points are these in this graph as in relation to the original data? Say again, sorry. It's, uh, how many inducing points do you have? Yeah, how many um, red points do you have? Yeah, so I, here I have, I've got only six little Z points. Six. Uh, so they're, they're marked in red. Can you, can you see them on the bottom no, of there? Right, okay. Uh, 
They are here, 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 here. There are just six of them. So we've massively reduced the computational complexity, but the approximation is really, really poor. And this is going to let me play with this idea over here. What happens if I try to, given these, these things over here, I've got a must have a pretty poor approximation of log p of y, right? So if I then optimize the uh, covariance function parameters with these z points fixed, so I'm still fixing z to here and over here, and I optimize the length scale and variance of the GP, then I get some bias in my estimation. So this, this length scale is far too long. But it's kind of it's kind of failed in a graceful way. Right? That's uh, that was a good smile. <laughs> the uh, not having enough inducing points or not having sensibly placed enough inducing points is going to give you bias in trying to estimate the covariance function parameters because it's going to try to minimize this callback level divergence as well as optimize the marginal likelihood. So this thing sort of acts as a as a, as a bias term there. Okay, well, you'd be pleased to know that six is probably a few too many. So here's another example with just 10 inducing points. So the rest of the thing into 50. So that's the uh, approximation on the top there, and that's the exact solution on the bottom, and there really is no visible difference. And I can compute, because this problem is very small, I can actually compute log p of y, and I can compute p, uh, this, this lower bound on log p of y, and hopefully you can see that they're really similar. Right, so they're here. Uh, so one of them is minus 50.2, and the other one's minus 50. So this callback level of evidence is small. There's 0.2 of a nat difference. This guy in blue. Okay, so how do you choose the number of points, and how do you choose the points? How do I, how do I choose how many? Yeah, how, how does well, that's a good question. So the, the problem is, what you would like to do is do what I've just done, right, and say, well, I can compute this thing and this thing, and then uh, if this thing is small, then I'm happy. <coughs> but that's really hard to do, because... Uh, because this thing costs sort of n cubes. So there are loads of problems where you could compute this, but you can't compute this. So my recommendation for a strategy would be pick 100 points, fit the model. Now pick 200 points and fit the model. Pick more points, fit the model, and watch this thing asymptote out. One of the really nice things about this approximation, one of the reasons I would advocate this variational way of doing this approximation is you can prove that adding more points always improves the approximation. You can prove that adding an extra z point makes this callback level divergence smaller. It might make it a very small amount smaller, but if you pick it carefully, you can always make that smaller. So my recommendation is a strategy where you pick something that's easy, pick a number that's very easy, you increase it, you hope it asymptotes out before you run out of compute power. Yeah? Just a stupid question. So, so what would then happen if you choose more viewpoints than you have data points? That's a great question. Let's try it. Uh, so of course it will cost more than, uh, suddenly it will cost more than the original computation, right? That's yeah. pretty obvious. But let's just try it and see what happens. Uh, let's make m is equal to, say, 300. OK, there you go. So these are all of my inducing points down here. And now the, the marginal likelihood is now, I think that's pretty close. The difference between these is really, really small. And I, that's, that's pretty much the resolution, right? Of course, that's the most sensible thing to do, but it's a really nice, uh, really nice demo for showing that more inducing points is always better. Yeah. Good question. Yeah. How do you actually pick the points? Because at the first example, it seemed like there were, you got three points at two different areas. And then in the second example, it seems they were equally spaced. Spread out. Right. That's a really nice property of what's happening here. I should have explained that more carefully. So I have. Uh, in the first case, I deliberately picked these two blocks of three to show you like, uh, how it's going to fail. So this is, this is a deliberate setup by me to make it work badly. In the second case, where it's working much more nicely, uh, down, oh, let's put this back to 10. So you can see that I've uh, initialized these things randomly between 0 and 12. And then I've optimized them. Uh, inside here. So if I do, if I do this, 
So if I print the model, you can see here that the parameters are the kernel variance, the kernel length scale, the noise variance, and this 10 by 1 vector of inducing points. And I just concatenate them all into one big thing and throw it into my favorite optimizer. And uh, they, they naturally spread out like that. They were initialized at random. Because that's, that's sort of how you would minimize this callback level divergence thing. Yeah. Uh, have you studied the, you know, the, the length scale parameter and with relation to the location of the inducing points? How, how they relate to each other? How are they re correlated? Because uh, if you got, well, it, it, what, it, what it seems like, if you have uh, a spread length scale, you're going to have a spread. Yeah. Inducing points. So if you have a really long length scale parameter, you're not going to need as many inducing points, right? Somehow, uh, one, of, one of my colleagues in Cambridge, Rich Turner, puts it as, you need one inducing point per wiggle. Uh, so for every sort of lump you want in this posterior, you need an extra inducing point. So if, if your data is actually really well explained by something very, very smooth, you'll get a really good approximation using a very small number of inducing points. Another thing to note, actually, is if you have a linear kernel in here, you only ever need one inducing point. Because you all need to know, it kind of makes sense, right? All you need to know is the slope of the line. So you only need one inducing point and it will be exact. The callback level divergence will be zero. So unless you have an offset, in which case you need two. I mean, the, the if you got uh, a lot of inducing points, maybe your approximation is going to have a very short length scale. Yeah, so if, you, if your, your real posterior is really, really wiggly, but with a very short length scale, you're going to need a lot of inducing points in order to get a good approximation. Exactly. So uh, it's going to work really well if the data are somehow redundant. And this guy must have an aching arm. Yeah. Uh, two questions that are just uh, One is that, um, as you're going to optimize your inducing points or screen points or whatever, um, is, is it, I know it's a variation of A's and stuff, but like, for example, with um, excitation maximization, there is cases where it won't converge and it keeps popping back around. Obviously, this is like a modal scheme. It takes yeah, it's a good question. So I don't have any formal analysis on uh, how to optimize theta and Z. Anyway, there's no um, expectation to pull maximization instead. There's no closed form optimum ever. So uh, in practice, I've found that you can just optimize them all together. But there are some occasions for difficult problems where you have to coax it into a good solution. So if you initialize Z in a really stupid way, let's see if we can do it. If we initialize Z in a really silly fashion, uh, Let's try. OK. So here what I've done is I've got one inducing point. Well, I've got 10 inducing points, but they're all really, really close together. And the initial condition is over here. And oh, OK, that didn't work. <laughs> and the optimizer has actually managed to spread them out all out across here. So I guess that's a testament to how well it can work. But in high dimensions, that can not happen. Sometimes you can get a local minimum, and you can find that these z points won't spread out very well at all. Yeah. yeah. And part two is, um, why do we assume the same kernel upon the inducing points as we do? Because if we have more data, surely... Why do I assume the same kernel? Yeah, exactly. It might make sense to um, different kernels for each inducing point. I guess you could, uh, you could assume a different kernel. But one of the computations that we did earlier required the kernels to be the same. There was an equation that, that cancelled out somewhere where the kernels having the same structure, at least, had to be, was a requirement for the, uh, it would be interesting to see what would happen to different kernel. I guess that's an open, open problem. Yeah, this guy. Just something that's not very clear to me. Do the inducing points have to be points from the original data set or not? Yeah, well, the inducing points have to be close to the data in the kernel sense. Uh -huh. So uh, in this case, it's just close to the data because, because we've got an RBF kernel. You could pick them. Or you could pick them from the data. Uh, and you could randomly select them from the data and then optimize from there. That's a good strategy. Actually, what I tend to do for difficult problems, for high dimensional problems, is uh, run k-means clustering, which is really cheap on the data, and then use the k-means centers. So I should emphasize that this, this kind of looks, um, I, I'm sort of covering the whole space over here right, with, with these inducing points. And the algorithm naturally does that. 
So even though I've initialized them up here, it wants to spread them out to cover the whole space. But actually, this works really well in high dimensional problems as well. So there are some DP approximations that are, there are some DP computational methods that are exact, but they require you to have a very low dimensional problem. So if you have uh, evenly spaced points uh, with a stationary kernel, you can use a circular matrix trick to do quite a lot of points. Or you can use a Kalman fault or something. But this, this approximation is great because it doesn't matter what the kernel is. You can build whatever fancy kernel you want with multiple outputs and all kinds of complicated things. And also, this works uh, in, uh, I've got a paper recently where we fit this kind of approximation to the MNIST data set. So the input space is 780 something pixels. And we're finding, if you imagine the 784 dimensional space, we've got a thousand of these points or so. And they're very sparsely propping up this space. But uh, the accuracy is still really good. It works really well. So because in most high dimensional problems, you only really need to support the function. You only really need to know the value of the function at a small number of points anyway. This approximation can be pretty good. Yeah. The number of pseudo inputs that you might only need a few pseudo inputs in one dimension as opposed to another dimension. Because you were saying there that the length scale and the number of inducing points. Right. Uh, that you get. So if you've got too many pseudo inputs, do you end up with a smaller length scale than what you would necessarily Do you end up with a small length scale? Right. So you only get bias one, one side, yeah. as it were. So if you have too many pseudo inputs, like this guy here suggested, then you won't get uh, you won't get the length scale doing something horrible. You will get something that hopefully works quite nicely. So here we've got a hundred, and there are some redundant ones over here. So they they haven't been optimized away from where they started because there's there's no gradient because the this is sufficient as it were. But you don't get a bias towards having too short a length scale. You only have a, ever have a bias towards having too long a length scale. Uh, I'm going to I'm gonna have to wrap up, so uh, I've got a couple more things to show you, but I'm going to be here for the rest of the afternoon, so if you want to come and grab me, ask a question, that would be great. But I've just got a couple of minutes, and there's a couple of, I want to summarize what I'm doing, and I want to show you one more thing before we finish. Uh, where did my slides go? Okay, so I'm going to whiz through this part, but one really cool thing about what's happening here is uh, this computation cost order nm squared, but there is actually a way to, uh, if n is really, really big, then it would be quite nice to do some kind of stochastic optimization like people do in neural networks. So this, one of the great things about this cool back level divergence-based method is you can extend this idea to doing stochastic optimization. So you can take chunks of data, update an approximation to p tilde of u, and then take a new chunk of data and, get, and suck the information out of it and do a stochastic optimization procedure. That's one of the great benefits of this callback leveler method. There are some notes in my slides, which I'll distribute. Uh, I want to emphasize, again, this, this callback level divergence is what we end up minimizing. And this is a bit of a weird callback level divergence. So uh, it's, if you're a variational based after condos, you'll say, well, why the hell is you over here? I'm, doing some, I'm not just minimizing the, the divergence to the posterior, which would just be f. I'm minimizing divergence to f and u given y, and that's kind of weird. Actually, it turns out that what we're doing is equivalent to minimizing the callback level divergence between two whole stochastic processes. So the reason that this u lives in here is it's just part of the rest of the stochastic process that we don't normally consider. And similarly, on this side, we should probably include an f star as well, because we do have an f star in the approximation. We just defined it like this. This, this is the only uh, instance that I know where variational Bayes is working with two you know, infinite objects. Uh, I've talked about prediction. OK. So hopefully I've sort of poked you through the variational sparse TP method. There are labs coming up so you can play with these ideas. I'm going to distribute this notebook that I've shown you as well. Uh, and I've really only shown you my favorite way through the literature, my, my uh, my favorite way through what people have done, 
But I like it because uh, I like it because of the behavior that we've talked about. I like the way that when you optimize this thing, it automatically spreads out these points amongst the data for you. That's like that, that seems like great behavior to me. Other approximation methods don't do that. You can extend this pretty straightforwardly to the classification case, or the log Gaussian Cox process case, or Poisson regression, or all kinds of other things pretty easily. You can do multiple outputs. It works perfectly with multiple outputs. Uh, you can do stochastic optimization, that I've mentioned. I think there are loads of ways that you could extend this uh, basis of the idea about, about sparse GPs. I've tried really hard to say, uh, to distinguish the approximation to the model with these tildes from the approximate model. So there's a, there's a strong school of thinking in the literature about replacing the Gaussian process model with the sparse Gaussian process model. It, it, it's, it's a valid way to think. One, one way you could think about what's happening here is replacing the covariance matrix with a low rank matrix. I think this is a tidier way to look at what's going on here. You've got an approximation that's sparse, but hopefully it recovers exactly the full model. We're not approximating the model, we're making an approximation to the model. I think that's an important thing to note. And of course, uh, this, this really is only one thread through some of the literature. There are lots of other things going on. In fact, a Google Scholar sparse Gaussian process this morning, and there were 400,000 hits. And I think I've mentioned like five papers. So uh, if you're one of the other 405,995 authors, then sorry. And just to wrap up finally and lead into Alan's talk, which is starting shortly, I'm going to give you a quick demo of how you can do, uh, where has it gone? Non-Gaussian likelihoods in GPI. So here what I'm doing is I've got some random inputs for x. I am getting random observations y, which is just 1 or 0. So this is GP classification. Right? And so here, the, here are the data. They're either 1 or they're 0. And this is the, the magic line that you need. You just pass the subject an x, a y, a kernel, which you'll be familiar with from the tutorials by now, and the likelihood, which in this case is a Bernoulli likelihood. And you set some z for these things as well. Exactly the same way as the rest of the code. Hit m dot optimize, and it does exactly this thing on the board over here, and spit out something like this. So here are the inducing points, nicely spread out across the data points, and here is the approximation to the posterior. The real posterior is in this figure here. So you can see that it's very close to being right. One of the things to note about other likelihoods is sometimes there's less information in a data point for, say, classification than there is for regression. Classifi a classification data point really doesn't tell you very much about what's happening to the function at that point. It says the function is positive here or the function is negative here. So this uh, compression idea, this, this way of um, Gathering all the information into a small number of points can actually work really, really well for other likelihoods. I'm done. Anna is going to talk about non Gaussian likelihoods. Thanks.
So yeah, I'm Alan Saul, uh, and today I'm going to talk to you about using non-Gaussian likelihoods in this Gaussian process framework that we've been introducing over the last couple of days. Uh, so first of all, I'm going to motivate the problem by talking about some of the different types of data types that we might be interested in, uh, some of the assumptions that we've been making so far in this uh, Gaussian process framework. Uh, Unfortunately, by handling uh, non-Gaussian data, uh, this gives rise to some intractabilities in the computation of the posterior distribution, very similarly to uh, what James was just talking about. So I'm going to introduce a range of different methods that we can use to approximate this posterior distribution. The first of which is going to be a very simple method called the Laplace approximation. Uh, the second method is the KL method, or the variational method which again is very similar to what uh, James was just talking about. And I'll hopefully go through this a little bit slower for those of you who are less familiar with variational methods. Uh, I'll very briefly touch on the expectation propagation algorithm, which is also widely used. And then finally, I'll wrap up by uh, comparing these different approximations uh, on a toy uh, classification example, similarly to what James just did a moment ago. So, so far we've had this uh, We've been looking at this model. We're interested in learning uh, a distribution over these nonlinear functions, f. So we're trying to look for a posterior distribution over what we think these underlying latent functions might be doing. Uh, so here in orange, we can see some realizations of uh, what these functions could be doing. However, we don't necessarily believe that the functions are going exactly through all of the data points that we've seen. We actually think that the observations that we see, y, are some Gaussian corruption uh, of these functions. So the corruption that we uh, add is this uh, Gaussian corruption with a uh, variance of sigma squared. Uh, one of the implicit things that we're assuming by assuming a Gaussian likelihood is that, uh, that these observations could live anywhere on the real space. So they could live, so we could see an observation of uh, minus 6.3 or plus 3.8, uh, but not all data that you might collect in some sort of experiment might actually have this uh, property. It might have some restrictions about what you expect to see. Uh, and we're going to try and handle this with a uh, non-Gaussian likelihood. First of all, I just want to introduce some notation that we're going to uh, use throughout this presentation. Uh, so. As before, we're going to have this Gaussian process prior over what we think these functions are going to be doing uh, before we've uh, observed any data. So yesterday, we were talking a lot about different uh, kernel functions that we might use, which can make uh, different assumptions about what we think the function might actually be doing. So uh, Nicola was talking about these periodic kernels, which say uh, we don't know what the function is going to be doing yet, but we think it is going to have some sort of periodic component to it. And then you have the RBF, which is assuming that this function is going to be very smooth, and various other covariance matrix, <laughs> other kernel functions, you might assume. So this is the thing I'm going to be concerned with today. So, so far, we've been uh, assuming, as I said, that we've got these uh, independent corruptions of these uh, latent functions, and this is what we're actually observing in the end. So they're independent in that uh, each corruption with uh, is uh, completely independent given that we know what the function value is at this point. So uh, in standard Gaussian process regression, we have this nice property where if we have a Gaussian likelihood and a Gaussian prior, then we can get a handle on an analytical form for this uh, Gaussian process posterior. Um, so I just want to uh, make a note of... Uh, what a likelihood actually is. So the likelihood is the probability of the data given that we've seen what this underlying latent function is. Uh, you can also view it from uh, the function's perspective. And in this case, it's the likelihood that the uh, function will give rise to these observations that we've seen given this uh, chosen corruption. So as I said, uh, so far we've been assuming that this distor distortion is uh, Gaussianly distributed. Uh, but, that's, but this implicitly uh, implies that we could observe observations anywhere. This wouldn't be the case if we were looking at other data types. For example, you might be interested in modeling uh, count data, so where you've, you only expect to see integer values. Uh, 
and you expect them to always be positive or zero. So you don't want to, you don't want to give any probability uh, density to these, uh, these situations where you could get an observation of a negative number because it doesn't make any sense uh, under the data that you're interested in. Another example is this, uh, if you were looking at a classification task, so you were interested in associating a particular input with an associated class, either one or zero. Uh, in this case, your observations would be uh, whether this input was associated with class one or whether it was associated with class zero. So in this case, you only have a binary input and it doesn't make sense, again, to give any uh, mass to any areas which are, say, 6.3. It doesn't make sense. You wouldn't expect to see it. So I'm just going to focus on this binary example for a moment. Um, so as I said, we have uh, some binary outcomes, either 1 or 0. And as James just showed a moment ago, uh, we want to model the probability that we're going to see a uh, observation of class 1 using this uh, Gaussian process framework. So here I've got some realizations of uh, what the Gaussian process posterior might look like. But we have this restriction where if we want to use, a, uh, if we want to use our Gaussian process as a probability, obviously we need this probability to be somewhere between 0 and 1. We can't use the probability of 10. It doesn't make sense either. So in practice, what we need to do is we need to uh, squash this function in some way such that we expect it to own it, such that it can only give rise to values between 0 and 1. Uh, so you could use this, uh, various different squashing functions. So this is the same as if you were doing logistic regression or something. You could use a logistic squashing function. Or here I've used a probit squashing function. So you can see that uh, here in orange, we have these uh, squashed realizations coming from this uh, posterior distribution where I've got samples from it in green. And now our posterior distribution, once it's been squashed, only exists between 0 and 1. And we can use this to uh, decide how probable it is we're going to see a observation of class 1. So as we can see here, if we have uh, this squashed function is close to 0, then we only expect to see observations of class 0. If this squashed function is close to 1, then we only expect to see observations of class 1. And if this squash function is somewhere in between, i.e. it's somewhere around 0.5 or something, then we're not really sure about what sort of observation we might see. We could either see a 0 or we could see a 1. So what we've done is we've transformed uh, this function, which can live in, any, uh, in the real space, and used it as a probability in a Bernoulli likelihood. So another example, uh, this is a simplification of what we might do in a Poisson regression case. Uh, so here we're interested in modeling count data. So this is data which is non-negative uh, and it only comes in discrete values. So it could be zero or any positive integer. So here I've got a little example where we've got some observations uh, which only come in discrete values. There's no uh, decimal values between these. And uh, one uh, traditional model to use for this is to assume that the observations that we're seeing are coming from a Poisson distribution. So a Poisson distribution has a rate or an intensity function, uh, which describes uh, what sort of uh, rate we expect to see these event events at a particular time point. So as we can see, if the, uh, if the event was quite high, then we expect to see large counts coming out from this uh, model. Uh, just as before, where we had some restrictions, uh, we, needed, uh, we had to restrict uh, this function to be between 0 and 1. The intensity also has some in restrictions. And in this particular case, the intensity function uh, must be constrained to be positive. So instead of using a squashing function to keep it between 0 and 1, we're going to use uh, some function which will ma maintain it uh, being positive. So we might use an exponential function or we might use a squared function. Uh, and using this, as I said, we can see realizations of this uh, positive constrained function shown in orange. And uh, this models the intensity at which we expect to see rates coming in. And this is what we're interested in in this case. So unfortunately, uh, by introducing this non-Gaussian likelihood component, 
So substituting this uh, Gaussian likelihood that we've been assuming so far and putting in this non-Gaussian uh, likelihood instead, it means that uh, this marginal likelihood, this integral that we need to do to compute the marginal likelihood, uh, is no longer analytically tractable. And as a result of this not being tractable, it means that, that our posterior distribution, P of F, given Y, is no longer tractable as well. So this is what we think the function will do, given that we've seen some data points now. Now we've taken into account this likelihood contribution, what do we think the function's actually going to do? So it's ruled out all of these functions which don't go anywhere near the data point in some way. So throughout the rest of this talk, I'm going to introduce a series of approximations uh, that we're going to make to this uh, distribution here. So this distribution is no longer Gaussian, as we've combined, as this has ruined this uh, Gaussian assumption by introducing this non-Gaussian thing here. Um, however, all of the methods that I'm going to introduce today are going to assume that we're making a Gaussian approximation to this non-Gaussian distribution, P of F given Y. And throughout, I'll call the, uh, the Gaussian approximation, I'll call it Q of F. So Q means approximation in some way. So one of the nice things about assuming that we have a Gaussian approximation here is that just as James wrote before, where we would have this prediction equation for these new function values at some locations x star, which I've omitted here. Um, since we can no longer compute this analytically, uh, that means that we can't do this integral analytically. But if we substitute in this uh, surrogate distribution for um, what the true posterior, so a Gaussian approximation to what the true posterior looks like, it means, that again, this guy is Gaussian, this guy is Gaussian, and we can do this uh, integral in a tractable way again and make predictions easily. Um, so the first approximation that I'm going to introduce is the Laplace approximation. Uh, it's an extremely simple approximation. Some of you may already know about it already. Um, so the idea of the Laplace approximation is to uh, take this posterior distribution here, take the log of it, and then we're going to find the modes of this, uh, of this log true posterior distribution. And we can do this because uh, in order to get uh, P of F given Y as being proportional to this, we can ignore this normalizer here. So we can just take the log of these two terms and we can write that down mathematically. So uh, the way the Laplace approximation works is it uses an optimization to find this uh, modal point of this true posterior distribution, which we can't calculate in full. Uh, around this modal point, we make a, a second order Taylor expansion. And this will allow us to get a handle on the curvature at this specific point. Uh, I'll show this visually in a second, so I'm not just waving my hands around. Um, <laughs> so the, the form of the approximation that we're going to make with the Laplace approximation is simply we're going to set the mean as equal to this modal value that we found via this optimization. And we're going to match the same curvature at this point. Uh, and again, I'll show this visually in a moment. So what we're doing is we're making, we've got this thing that we can't compute. We're going to make a Gaussian approximation where we set the mean of this Gaussian to being equal to the mode and the curvature equal to the same curvature at this uh, modal point of the true posterior distribution. So. Uh, we have this, this guy here. This is just the, um, set, uh, just the negative Hessian of the log likelihood, where our likelihood is non-Gaussian. But in general, we can write down uh, the second derivative at this modal point. Uh, we can just write it down mathematically as well, as long as we can write down the likelihood mathematically. Um, for most likelihoods, which we'd be interested in, we'll be assuming that we've got a factorizing assumption. Just as, in, uh, just as before, when we were looking at the Gaussian case, we have this factorization where the corruption is independent given f. Um, for most likelihoods that we'll be interested in, we'll uh, maintain this factorization. And that will mean that this matrix here is uh, diagonal, and it allows us to make some particularly numerical stable operations. So now I'm going to show this visually. So here we're just going to look at a single marginal uh, of, the, uh, of the posterior distribution. So here I've got the prior, sorry, coming from uh, this Gaussian process prior. Uh, then we combine this with this non-Gaussian likelihood, which is coming, which we've defined. It's 
somehow modeling uh, the corruption on this function. And when we take the product of these two and we renormalize, then we'd have this uh, non-Gaussian posterior distribution. So you can see it's non-Gaussian as it's got a heavier tail on the left-hand side, so it's slightly skewed. Um, but in general, we can't get a handle on this. This is what we'd like to have, but we can't actually get a handle on it. So what the Laplace approximation does is it takes an initial random guess at where the mode might be. You do some optimization in order to find this modal point. And at this point, you look at what the curvature is around this point. And then simply you make a Gaussian approximation where you're using the same mode and the same curvature at this point. So it's a local approximation just around this, uh, this modal point of the true posterior distribution. And what you get is shown in uh, magenta here. So we can see that we've managed to capture most of the density of the true posterior distribution. Um, but we've missed some here, and we've, uh, we've overestimated it here. So that's the Laplace approximation. We just uh, find the modal point, and we make a local approximation around this point uh, using a Gaussian approximation. So now I'm going to talk about the KL method, or variational method, as it's also known. Uh, which follows on from what James was just talking about a moment ago. Um, so in the variational method, again, we're going to make a Gaussian approximation to this distribution that we can't compute. Um, but instead of simply setting the mean equal to this modal value and looking at the curvature, we're going to treat these parameters mu, or these two sets of parameters mu and c, as what we call variational parameters. So these variational parameters are different from model parameters in that by uh, modifying their values, we're not actually affecting uh, our underlying model about what we actually believe about the data. We're just affecting the quality of our approximation. So we can move these guys around, and we'll either get a better or worse approximation to the true posterior distribution, which is defined by our model. So the way that the KL divergence method works, or the variational method, is that we uh, define a divergence between uh, the two distributions that we have, our approximate distribution and our true distribution. So since this guy isn't computable, that means that we can't compute this KL divergence, of course. Um, and the KL method will work by um, trying to minimize this metric in uh, a specific way. So first of all, I want to introduce the KL, uh, the KL divergence measure for those of you who aren't already familiar with it. Uh, so I'm going to introduce it in a general sense where we've, we're just looking at two distributions, Q of X and P of X. These can be any two types of distributions, and we can always uh, define the KL divergence between them, although we can't necessarily evaluate it. Um, so the KL divergence, as James said, is the average additional amount of information uh, required in order to specify the values of x uh, as a result of using this approximate distribution q of x instead of the true distribution p of x. Uh, you can write it in the following way. It's just a log of q of x over p of x all under the expectation of uh, q of x. So it has a couple of useful properties. Uh, one of them is that it's always zero or positive, and it alone It'll only be positive, it'll only be zero in the case when these two distributions are identical. Uh, and the fact that it never goes negative is a property that we're, never gonna, uh, we're gonna use uh, in a moment. It also has this property where it's not symmetrical. So uh, the KL divergence between Q of X and P of X is not the same as the uh, KL divergence between P of X and Q of X. So let's look at this visually to see uh, how it how the KL divergence changes uh, in response to changes in the approximate distribution Q of X. Is it working? No. Yeah. Uh, so here I'm going to look at the KL divergence between two Gaussians. But as I said, uh, you can define the KL divergence between any two distributions. I'm doing this for convenience, as it allows us to uh, see that the KL divergence does indeed go to zero when the two distributions are identical. So to start off with, I'm uh, assuming two Gaussian distributions where we have uh, exactly the right variance, uh, but the mean is off by uh, two. So initially, the KL divergence, KL divergence between our approximate distribution, this red curve, and this uh, true distribution, this blue curve, is initially quite high. Uh, 
as we move the mean closer to the, uh, the true mean, the two uh, distributions diverge less, so the KL divergence drops. When uh, the two distributions are identical, uh, the KL divergence will go to zero. And then as you would expect, as you start moving the mean away, the KL divergence begins to grow again. Nope. Yeah. Okay, so this is uh, the same example, but here we've set the uh, means to be identical and we're gonna vary the variance instead. Uh, initially, our approximate distribution is underestimating the variance. Uh, and then, as you would expect, as the variance becomes more accurate, uh, the KL divergence drops, and then as we start overestimating the variance, then the KL divergence grows. Is there any questions so far? No? Okay. Um, so the KL divergence, me uh, uh, the KL divergence uh, method is going to use uh, this KL divergence as we just defined it, as you might expect. Um, and as I said, we're going to assume a Gaussian approximation to this posterior distribution, uh, P of F given Y, which we can't compute. And the approximation is going to have two sets of variational parameters, mu and C, which we can change however we want. And it will only affect how good our approximation is. Um, so we're going to write down, uh, using Bayes' rule, what the uh, true posterior distribution looks like. And it has this marginal likelihood uh, term which we can't compute. And then we're going to find, as I said before, we're going to define the KL method as trying to minimize the KL divergence between our approximate distribution and our true distribution. So, of course, we can't compute this quantity, so we can't just minimize it directly. If we, if we could compute P of F given Y, then we just use P of F given Y, and we wouldn't have to do any approximations in the first place. So, because we can't compute this property, uh, we're going to write down the KL divergence in full here. And then we're going to substitute in um, this using Bayes' rule for this uh, true posterior distribution here. So anything marked in red uh, isn't tractable to compute uh, analytically. So that leaves us with the following three terms. We have the log of Q of F over P of F, all under the expectation of Q of F. And following from the definition of the KL divergence, that's just equal to the KL divergence between this Q of F, our approximate distribution, and this P of F, our prior distribution, this Gaussian process prior we defined at the beginning. Um, we also have this term, which is simply uh, the expected value of this guy under this guy, and I'll come back to this in a moment. And then finally, we have this uh, log marginal likelihood term. Um, under the expectation of Q of F. However, this guy is a fixed term given, uh, this guy is a uh, fixed value given our model. So it's completely independent of what we do to our approximate distribution Q of F. So that means that this guy, the expectation just disappears and we don't have to worry about it. Uh, so if we rearrange the terms, so we have the log marginal likelihood on the left here, uh, we have this term, which I'll come back to in a moment, but we can, in general, we can compute this term. That's why it's in green. Uh, we have this KL divergence here, which is just the uh, KL divergence between two multivariate Gaussian distributions, which again is a computable quantity. And then finally, we have this, uh, this KL divergence between our approximate posterior and our true posterior, which is something we can't compute. So we've got two terms, two terms we can't compute. One of them is completely independent of what we do to our approximate distribution, our marginal distribution. So here we've just got the same equation at the top. And the way the variational method works is that you say, since this guy is completely independent of what I do to Q of F, uh, and so I know this guy is a fixed value. Now, if I maximize these two terms, which I can compute, then I'm necessarily minimizing the KL divergence between our approximate distribution and our true distribution. And this is what we're trying to do in the end, right? We're trying to make our approximate distribution diverge as little as possible from this true distribution, uh, P of F given Y. So in practice, we can, we can optimize these variational parameters, uh, mu and C, in order to make this value as large as possible. <coughs> 
Um, so we still have this guy, uh, which isn't altogether uh, obvious how you compute this. Um, but it turns out uh, with factorizing likelihoods, as James was just showing a moment ago, uh, this can actually be done with a series of n one-dimensional integrals. So these one-dimensional integrals uh, are possible to do uh, using some sort of numerical quadrature, and they're relatively cheap to do as well, and also relatively accurate, since we're evaluating the expectation of this log p of y given f. So it's, it's quite accurate to do these one-dimensional integrals. Um, so in practice, we can reduce the number of variational parameters that we need by uh, reparameterizing the C matrix uh, in the following way. OK, so any questions? That's a crash course in variational methods. No? Nope? OK, must be easy. Um, so now I'm very briefly going to introduce the expectation propagation method. Um, so I'm not going to go into too much depth about this method because uh, it's relatively complex. In fact, in previous years, we've had an entire lecture just on introducing this approximation. Um, so I want, to, I want to skip over the details and hope to give a general idea about how it's actually working. Um, yeah? Sorry? Oh, this lambda, this is just a, these aren't eigenvalues. These are just what I called these parameters. Okay. Call them A. Okay. Yeah? Sorry, that's probably confusing. Yeah? You can use a multivariate. Yeah, I think someone, someone is it Edwin Vanilla, has done some work on using a mixture of Gaussians to do this approximation instead. So it works the same way, right? Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? OK. Uh, so yeah, so we have this ex we're looking at the expectation propagation algorithm, which is relatively complex to introduce in five minutes. Um, but the general way it works is that we, so we have this um, non-Gaussian posterior distribution, and the non-Gaussianity is coming from these guys. Um, and the expectation propagation algorithm um, uses the following factorization for its Gaussian approximation to the posterior distribution. So what we're doing, in, in a sense, is we're replacing each one of these uh, likelihood contributions by uh, what we call a site distribution, which is called TI. And each one of these site distributions themselves are uh, unnormalized Gaussian distributions. And these have some parameters of their own, uh, mu squiggle and sigma squiggle. I don't know what the technical name is. <laughs> um, so the way the expectation propagation algorithm works is that we are, um, it's an iterative method. So we've replaced each one of these uh, actual likelihood terms with a local likelihood term, a site term. And it works in an iterative fashion where we look at each one of these um, site distributions and we try and, and we hold all of the other ones fixed and we try and update these, uh, these site terms in such a way that our posterior approximation or a posterior distribution is closer to our approximation. And I can go into depth about that, but it won't be pretty. <laughs> yeah? This is, an, this is the term which you would you Wait, which one? This one or this one? Which term? Which? ZI. ZI. This one. Yeah. Uh, so this makes, so this would otherwise be a normalized Gaussian distribution, and this unnormalizes it in some way. And I think these are going to be captured inside. The actual normalizer is going to be captured inside this to normalize this entire distribution. Yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's the normalizer of all of this guy to make it an actual Gaussian distribution like this. Okay, skip that. 
Um, so now I'm going to introduce, uh, I'm going to compare these posterior approximations that we've been make, making. So we've introduced these three approximations. We've got the Laplace approximation, um, we've got the KL method or variational method, and we've got this expectation propagation algorithm. And uh, we want to see what properties each one of these different types of distribution, uh, different types of approximations have. So here I'm going to use a, uh, I've got a Gaussian process prior, and I'm going to look at the uh, joint between uh, two function values at x1 and x2. So this is like these pill plots, which uh, Neil was showing yesterday, I think. Um, so what this says is that in our prior distribution, if we have a high value function for f1, then we expect to see a high value for f2 as well. So that means that uh, x1 and x2 are correlated strongly in some way uh, as given by this kernel function. Yeah. Um, and on the sides, we've got these marginal plots, which Neil was showing before. Um, so this is a projection through this. Uh, so yeah, that's the Gaussian process prior, just looking at two different um, function points. Uh, and on the right, we have this Bernoulli likelihood. And in this case, we're looking at the, uh, the probability that we'll get a uh, class one and class two for both of these function values. So as you would expect, uh, this is a highly probable situation if you're if f1 is large and f2 is large, then we expect both of them to give rise to a uh, class 1. So both, both of the observations of these f1s we expect to be of class 1 because both of these function values are high. So maybe I'm going too far back, but we had this. Uh, oh, that's a long way. <laughs> so we had this guy. So we, uh, if we have a high function value for f, f1 and a high value function for f2, then we expect both of these observations to be of class one. All right, back again. <laughs> uh, right, so what it's doing essentially is it's ruling out all of this area where either of these function values were uh, negative, then it's very improbable that we're going to get either of them, to, uh, we're going to get both of these realizations to be of class one. Right, does that make sense? Um, so as we know, by taking the product between uh, a Gaussian prior and a non-Gaussian likelihood, and then if we renormalize, then what we're going to get is a non-Gaussian uh, true posterior uh, distribution. So again, this is like this pill plot, but here we can see that the distributions are no longer Gaussian as we've been seeing so far. So uh, again, the non-Gaussian is they're skewed, and it's obviously not symmetrical. Uh, around the modal point. So what we want to do is we want to be able to approximate these guys, but this is actually going to be done in some n-dimensional space. I've shown a one-dimensional case, now I'm showing a two-dimensional case, and you're going to have to generalize up to more dimensions. Um, so what the Laplace approximation is doing is we're going to try and find the modal uh, point of this, dist uh, of this here. So the modal point is where it's most red in the center of here. And what the Laplace approximation will do is it will find this point via some optimization. It will make a Gaussian approximation using what the curvature is doing around this point. So essentially, it's trying to look at the curvature around here and look at the curvature around there. And it's going to make a, a, a Gaussian approximation using that curvature. Um, as we can see in this case, the Laplace approximation is quite poor. And the reason why we can see it's quite poor is we can see that it's assigned, so here in the true posterior distribution, we assign almost no density to this area where f1 and f2 are negative, because the likelihood is com completely ruled out this region, essentially. However, if we look at the Laplace approximation, we're actually assigning quite a lot of uh, density to this area. And we're also failing to capture this area where f1 and f2 are quite large. Uh, and this is arising because the because we have this skewed distribution, uh, the modal point is not very descriptive of what the distribution is doing as a whole. So just using this local approximation isn't a very good, isn't a very uh, descriptive 
uh, thing for the entire distribution. Um, OK, so that's the Laplace approximation. We're failing to capture this density up here, and we're putting too much density down here. Um, the KL divergence measure in uh, uh, methods in contrast, uh, in this case, we're minimizing this KL divergence between uh, our approximate distribution and our true distribution. So we've got some metric that we're trying to minimize. Uh, and this metric uh, penalizes heavily for assigning density to areas where there is very little density. So that is, it would penalize very heavily if you put much density in your uh, proximate posterior down in this area if there was none. So you can see, uh, in this case, it's very careful to try and avoid this region where there's uh, no density. Um, but as a result, it doesn't manage to capture this area very well where um, there is a lot of density. And there's no way that you can get uh, the best of both worlds when you're approximating with a Gaussian distribution itself. Perhaps something like a mixture of Gaussians might do better in this case. Yeah? Uh, so this is, so in general, you wouldn't be able to do this. I'm just doing this by like Markov, <laughs> by some Monte Carlo simulations. Uh, and EP in contrast. <laughs> um, so in EP, uh, EP penalizes, uh, it cares less about assigning areas, uh, density to this area uh, in the negative thing, but it's not so bad if you compare it to uh, the Laplace approximation back here. Um, and as a result, it, it's able to capture a lot more of this density in this area around here. So we can see that if we compare it to the KL method, it tends to spread out its mass further. And as a result, it's able to capture a lot more of this density around here. So this is a plot comparing uh, the marginals, which we had here on the right hand side. So these are the marginals of F2, uh, just to give a bit of a clear indication by comparing these methods. So uh, the true posterior distribution is shown here in red. The Laplace approximation uses the modal point of this and makes an, an approximation. And you can see it assigns way too much density to this area all the way over here. So as a result, it's quite a poor approximation for this specific likelihood that we're interested in. Um, the KL divergence, uh, in, uh, in contrast, tries really hard not to assign any density to this area on this, uh, on this tail here, where there's relatively little density shown by the true posterior distribution. However, as a result, it quite drastically underestimates the amount of density on this side here. And as you just mentioned, the EP method uh, will spread out its tails even further and try and capture more of this density around here. Uh, so now I just want to compare uh, some of the pros and cons of these uh, three different approximations that we could make um, and talk a little bit about when I might use each one in uh, different cases. So the Laplace approximation uh, is very fast, and that's one of its main benefits. Uh, and however, as we just saw a moment ago, if the, if the mode of the posterior distribution isn't very descriptive of what the distribution is doing as a whole, then it can make a poor approximation, as we just saw a moment ago. So I might use this if the posterior was well characterized by this modal uh, thing, such as in the Poisson example that I showed near the beginning. Um, so the KL divergence uh, has a pro in that it's uh, very principled. We're uh, defining this divergence that we wish to minimize, and then we're going directly for that objective. Um, and in practice, it can be relatively quick, and it can also lead itself, uh, lend itself well to sparse approximations. And James has done some work on uh, scaling this up to huge data sets on a classification task. Um, one of its cons, however, is that in general, it requires a factorizing likelihood in order to avoid having to do an, a single n-dimensional integral, which in practice might not be possible to do even numerically. Uh, if it has a factorizing likelihood, then it can do a series of n one-dimensional integrals instead, which are OK. Um, so I might use this method if I knew that the Laplace approximation was quite poor as uh, you have a lot more parameters that you need to fit. 
um, and the Laplace approximation should, be, should in theory be quicker. Uh, and I might also not use this uh, if the likelihood was, uh, I, I might also use this if the likelihood wasn't Bernoulli. And I might use the EP method uh, in the special case where uh, the likelihood was Bernoulli. So in this case, uh, it's shown to be very effective as an approximation for this classification task where we have binary inputs and outputs. Uh, sorry, binary outputs. Um, it has a con in that uh, it's relatively, uh, relatively slow uh, because you have to do this iterative update thing. Uh, and however, it is possible to extend to sparse cases. Um, so we can use some of the stuff that James was introducing earlier. Um, in the context of the EP method as well. Um, it can also have convergence issues for certain likelihoods. So that means updating these site parameters uh, can go on for a long time. Uh, and I'll skip the last point because I haven't talked in, uh, in depth about what the EP method is doing. Um, so I might use this if I was interested in binary data. And I might also use it uh, potentially if I had uh, truncated likelihoods of some type. So for example, in sensor data. So uh, the final thing that we was briefly mentioned earlier is that you could, do, you could use MCMC methods to just do sampling from this posterior distribution itself. Um, so if this has the obvious pro that in the theoretical limit, uh, this gives a true distribution for uh, P of F given Y. However, in practice, it can be quite slow, as was mentioned, when the data is quite large. Uh, I don't, there may be methods more recently which are more effective, uh, but I wouldn't. I wouldn't know exactly. Uh, so I'm, but I might use the MCMC method if time was not an issue, but exact accuracy was. So if I really needed the correct posterior distribution, and I didn't care about how long I needed to wait for it, then it might be a good approach. Uh, and also, if you were unsure about when it, whether one of your approximate, uh, approximations was appropriate in this specific likelihood case, uh, you could use the MCMC method as a ground truth to test uh, how effective your approximation would be. Okay, so that's the end of this presentation. Has anyone got any questions? Yeah? SMC? I wouldn't know, sorry. Don't know if anyone else might be more familiar with that. going on. One of the problems with, it depends on which method you're looking at particularly, but if you, the thing that you need to be able to compute here is a KL divergence, uh, sorry, here, is a KL divergence between 
uh, your approximate distribution and your, true, uh, and your prior distribution. So if this prior distribution was Gaussian and this was student t, then I'm not sure if you could compute that specific turn, in which case you can maximize them. Yeah, yeah. But if you were doing MCMC, then you, you might be better off just not making an approximation in general and just taking draws from a posterior distribution. Yeah? 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 Yeah. At the beginning, I was thinking of the higher moments, and it seems really tricky. Yeah. But now, since you have a spherically or uh, elliptically invariant distribution, you could have location scatter and some yeah. chain parameters. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. If you were looking, yeah, if you were looking at Laplace approximation, if you did it, yeah, you still have to choose a point to do it around. So the mode, for example. But you're right. You could, yeah, you could use an approximation which. Yeah, OK, yeah. So I think for the Laplace approximation, you could do it. Yeah. OK. Oh. Uh, OK, so do you mean for this guy here? Uh, what do you mean by factorizing? So I mean factorizing in the sense that... Uh, Factorizing in the sense here, where that just means that the corruption that you're going to do on each f is independent of one another. So here you have this diagonal corruption, right? Um, so that, that makes this assumption. That means that the corruption that you're going to do on yi, given fi, is independent of what you might, the corruption that you might do of uh, yi plus 1, given fi plus 1. The, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, because that, so the problem is, is that in order to compute this term here, uh, you use the fact that you have a log of a product over lots of yi's, and that means that you can take this sum outside, and then, the, and then you just have a series of one-dimensional integrals. If you can't take, if this isn't a product here, then you have to evaluate this thing in full. Okay. Okay, I think grubs up then. <laughs> <laughs>